Good, I'm glad here uh, to be here at UCLA. It's my uh, first time here. Uh, I've never been on this campus, as strange as it sounds. Um, yeah, but I'm newer to UC. I've only been here a year and a, a few months now. So I'm now starting to get out now that they're letting me leave my office uh, after the first year. Uh, before that, I was in Kentucky, uh, CIO there, for about uh, actually senior vice provost for analytics and technologies for about uh, seven and a half years. Prior to that, with DePaul University in Chicago uh, as CIO there, and prior to that was in industry mainly as a consultant, but also very active in Internet One days when wild, crazy stuff was going on left and right, and uh, that was a period of my life where uh, I started to drink coffee because I was only getting five hours of sleep a night. Can't do that forever. Uh, and prior to that was in uh, retail and newspaper reporter. So I've got a kind of a varied background. And what I want to talk today is what we're doing at UCSD with regard to student analytics and mobile. Uh, there's a tight connection between the two, which we'll share. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of our project, what we're doing, how's it going as well as a little bit of the history behind it. So I've broken this talk into kind of four pieces. Origins, it's getting at why are we doing this, kind of the, the, the history behind it. Uh, do we have any technologists in the room? Okay, so this is your part. You know, it's technical slides, and everybody else, you guys can nod off for a little bit, and the technologists can geek out. Uh, then I want to talk really about the meat of the matter, which is cultural preconditions uh, for how to do analytics, since I'm really about the democratization of data, data and that has a lot of implications for organizations and how we organize ourselves and deal with this and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the future which I think is actually the most exciting interesting frightening part of all of this as we get deeper and deeper into student data how many learning scientists in the room cognitive psychologists neuroscientists okay then don't keep your hands down for everybody else, how does the heart work? Tell me how it works, you know? Okay, it beats, good. What else? Pumps, and what parts does it have? Does it have valves? How many? Four, good. How many chambers? Four, good. So that, that's good. Good, good, good. Now, if your neighbor comes to you and says, I'm having heart problems, would you diagnose it? I think you'd say, go see your doctor. Great. Now I'm going to ask another question. How many of you can name an anatomical or a functional part of the brain involved in learning? Okay, that's usually what I get like crickets. Okay, now, if your neighbor comes to you and says, you know, my kid in high school is having trouble studying, you were in college, could you help them? Most of us would spend like three hours flailing about thinking we're helping them, okay? So that's the rough equivalent of a medieval doctor prescribing bloodletting, okay? Now don't feel bad because 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet involved with all the money in ed tech are in your camp. They have that much expertise on this problem, yet they are directing the state of affairs in this area. So collectively, the collective we, when it comes to how we learn, are operating in a state of naive ignorance, meaning we're, we're unaware of our ignorance, and worse still, we're spending money in. I've had this conversation with investors in the ed tech sector. I ask them, do you have a psychologist, cognitive learning, or whatever on staff who knows this stuff? Ba -ba -ba -ba. No, 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 but we know it will have a difference. Why? Because when I was in school, this is that N of 1, but this is the bad N of 1. <laughs> No methodology behind the N of 1 except me. And usually that one is male, typically white, and very wealthy. That's not my audience. Okay. I got students at the other end of the spectrum in our universities that we're trying to help. And so I'm starting this off with kind of why are we doing this from an origin standpoint. The other piece to this is, is there, this is a good book. I'm not really knowledgeable in in human genome and genomics. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a little bit kind of where you were on the heart, but I'm really fascinated by the information, infa informational aspects of this. This is a great book in which uh, Andres Wagner is talking about how does this wild diversity of life come about, the arrival of the fittest. 
not the survival of the fittest, not how selection works, but how uh, diversity works. And he basically starts to describe the methodology they use for uh, uh, unbundling the human genome into components and navigating it. And so he talks about a genomic library and a book being a potential solution to an environmental problem. And that would be a phenotype of some kind, some expression physically that would help the organism. And there are two to the 5,000 possibilities in the met metabolic genomic library, which is probably 30% or so or more of the, human of the animal genome. That's a, in technical terms, in IT terms, we call that a BFN, big number. <laughs> okay? That's a lot, right? And of that two to the 5,000, there's two to the 100 that are viable metabolic phenotypes for sustaining life. Now, what's interesting about this book, I learned another thing in, it, in that meta me metabolism is about input, conversion, output, right? So molecules come in, they go through another process, and then molecules come out in a different form. Oh my gosh, sounds like a global warming application, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, but there's so many opportunities for a proper example or a successful example of, uh, of a metabolic uh, profile that would work. So his con conclusion was, Life wasn't just an accident. It was, a pro it was a statistical or probabilistic inevitability because there are so many options for expressions that would work within the library. Now, the more interesting part of this when I read this was, my gosh, they've got a clear science, while not completely universally agreed upon, largely agreed upon, and they have a means of simulating rather robustly in order to find successful solutions without having to kill a lot of animals along the way. And so they have computational capabilities to explore this hyper-astronomical space. This also started me to think about the information complexity that results uh, in combinations of things. So if we have, let's say, 100 people in this room, uh, probably don't have 100, but if I had 100, if I wanted to take a picture of every combination of everybody, like just you, and then just you, and then the two of you, then the three of you, then just you, then the two of you, and repeated that process across the board with everybody, that would be two to the 100 possibilities. And if you do the math on that and say, okay, if I can take a picture every 30 seconds, how long would it take to take this picture? Well, that turns out to be another BFN. So it takes a very modest amount of information to create a vast, complex arrangement and combinations of information, all of which must be processed. Now this sets up, why is our brain so complicated? Well, it's trying to mirror the complexity of the information around it in the environment, right? Which then leads to the next topic. This is an interesting paper that came out a few years back. And I had a chance to talk to the principal author, Kenneth Kodinger, at uh, the Asilomar conference here uh, a couple years back about it. I grabbed him. I said, Ken, Ken, I read your paper. It was great. You know? He says, well, I just kind of did it as a lark because Gates Foundation was bugging us with some talk about stuff. And we were trying to explain to them how complex this is. And I said, yeah, but I think you misunderstood the complexity. He goes, oh, yeah, we, we know. Um, and if you consider the fact that you're going to do an instructional intervention of 30 instructional techniques, three treatment levels at two points in time, right, that can create two to the 95th possible combinations, just in that little example. But education isn't like that. Education is a series of emerging, unfolding events over time, <laughs> second by second, okay, for which the sequence and the timing is uncertain. So I did a little bit of math, and I said, okay, if I wanted to do a true super adaptive learning, real time, across a whole term thingy. Well, there's probably 10 to the 629 combinations, which now is a BFN raised to a BFN. So it, it's impossibly big. Now, it's even worse. We don't have a common theory for how learning occurs. We don't have a reasonable way of simulating. I'll have this debate with Conover. He's built simulation tools that simulate working memory. But in large, we don't have a good means for simulating the full learning thing. So the difference between the hard sciences and these sort of social and psychological sciences is the hard sciences have hope. We have none. <laughs> now, I, I do this because I'm trying to point out that the complexity of this instructional space for which a lot of ed tech technology and a lot of 
business propositions are being formed. Uh, and the proposition is being formed to say, hey, there's gold in this data, and we're going to be able to transform education by improving outcomes quickly, okay, within three, four years. And I usually am talking to investors going, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> probably not, <laughs> and here's why. Uh, it's a very complex space. And we don't even, in fact, the big difference between us and the health sciences that do controlled studies, we don't really have a, a good means of doing that. We do a lot of population statistics, uh, essentially, meaning pulling data from what has happened and trying to infer from it. We're going to need a whole lot of researchers in a whole lot of different places across the globe experimenting and innovating with what works in education until over time we can work <laughs> inductively and deductively at what are some ways to facilitate this. And why is this complicated? Well, because the information complexity or information representation complexities are naturally complicated, uh, and the human mind has grown complicated to adjust to that. Uh, so that's where this starts, is we need a way of experimenting with data uh, more rapidly uh, than we had in the past. So and I also start here because what the origin behind the, behind the Student Activity Hub, which I started with a few other folks in Kentucky, was uh, focused on students and we wanted to focus on the learning. We knew we just couldn't do it at first, so we focused on the typical administration reporting around the learning. When I left Kentucky, we were ingesting millions of learning uh, records uh, you know, per week into the system, and right now I believe they're just starting to open the can on the research on that. But we wanted to harvest as rich of a database as we could on some of those materials. So we started with this notion of student and learning at the core and then kind of work out. What you're going to see is kind of a little bit of working out than back in. The concept here on the Student Activity Hub is we have data on students spread out across all multiple systems. And we want to integrate it. Uh, we had the same situation in Kentucky. We had probably 20 or so major systems related, to, not major, major and somewhat major systems related to students tracking, typically tracking stuff, tracking attendance at events or tracking participation in things, uh, along with your typical degree audit tools, uh, student information system tools, et cetera. And over a period of years, we systematically integrated every single one of those and started to build a more comprehensive view of the student. And we're doing the same here at UCSD. And again, we've got a similar count, probably about 20 key systems we want to go after and start to integrate the data. For the technologists, the premise underneath our, or the platform underneath our solution is, is the SAP HANA product. Uh, I'm not here to tout the HANA product. That's not the point. But I am a technologist, and I have been studying database technology for a long time and had seen since Oracle, Microsoft, and IBM created their database platforms, zero greenfield database platforms of any sizable note. Meaning, this is not an easily start from scratch endeavor. And when SAP came out with this, I kind of had a little lip sigh. I said, oh my goodness gracious, this is a greenfield database development opportunity. What's going on? Well, Hasso Plotner, who's the founder of SAP, is a PhD. And he had a bunch of computer scientists, PhD, in his Hassel Plattner labs. Uh, and they went and read all of our books in computer science about how to do these things and put together a solution. And I think of it as an entirely in memory, almost like a high performance computing system, in memory system with no spinning disk. Uh, and it's more than just relational databases, it's a whole bunch of other stuff uh, graph, al al graphing algorithms for using graph theory to attack data problems, uh, full R embedding. Uh, into it, a uh, separate machine learning library, including the uh, machine learning libraries that are in R in there. Uh, full streaming integration, you can get out the data via all the typical ways you want, whether it be OWC, JWC, OData, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, API layer around the whole shooting match as well. So it's a very robust environment. When I saw that, I quickly realized it was going to be groundbreaking in the industry. It has been. Uh, I was probably the 40th customer globally in this product. First in, in government and higher ed globally. Uh, now they're up to thousands of customers and billions of dollars of revenue, and the market has shifted uh, in mass onto this platform. The reason I'm saying this is we found this environment to be 1,000 to 100,000 times faster than our Oracle warehouse. Okay, now pause. Sounds like 
you know, okay, what does that mean? Well, we had some processes in database land that were taking 32 hours to run. And they went down to like 20 seconds, right? And I remember one time I was, because I was insistent, I want every click with the lowest level of detail under it in less than one second. And my staff showed me a view early on, and I was taking like 8, 10, 12 seconds. I was ready to pull up the razor blade and start splitting my wrist. And I yelled at him. I said, this is not fast enough. They said, Vince, in the old environment, we turned the computer off after a week because it still didn't finish your query. I yelled, not good enough. Do you think I care about a wretched fiddle when the muse inspires? Get it faster. Uh, and, uh, and we worked on models to make that happen. Uh, so that speed is extremely important because for the analyst, Latency is like, you know, if you're, you're, you're nodding, you know, right? If you're an analyst and you're like waiting, you can wait a second or two. Seven or eight, forget it. I'm going to put it into some other environment where I have somebody else do it. When it's in that sub-second, especially that half second or less, now it's kind of addictive. You're like really getting into the analysis. And so we built the system for analysts to understand students, uh, first and foremost. And we needed the speed not because the institution needs real-time data, but because the analyst needs real fast exploration capabilities mentally. Uh, in the architecture itself, the real key portion of this is the higher ed data models. Uh, these are specially curated views that bring together data correctly for the technologist who's used to data warehousing, especially Kimball-style data warehousing. You know, forget it. Just, you can pretend you don't know anything about it. In fact, if you do know a lot about it, it will hurt you. I died in the wool Kimball person many years. The first time I designed in this environment, and me and my team, over six months, we threw away three designs because we had to keep unlearning our old data warehouse thinking, which is conserve space, normalize. You don't have to do that in this environment. It's a massively dedupe, compressed environment. You can make entire copies of tables, and it takes up practically no space. You can do Cartesian products. It practically doesn't impact performance. It behaves very differently than traditional databases. So these models really are long lists of fields in a single view fit for a specific purpose. So we have one called enrollment that's fit for looking at enrollment trends. We have one called class stats per term or section stats per term, which is looking at grading distribution trends. Um, and we design them specifically for a bounded sort of analysis purpose not a structure to reflect a universal existence beyond multiple analysis purposes. So if you caught that nuance, it's a big nuance. Data warehousing, you're constructing a universal model, you don't know what the analytical purpose is, we did the opposite. Let's build a view just for that analytical purpose and keep doing it, and by the way, reuse everything along the way. So if you know object-oriented programming, and that paradigm, then you're better suited for this. The other piece is, we have visualization tools. We had our model of bring your own tool to the community. We're not going to dictate the tool. Tableau's the winner, uh, so that's the dominant tool that people are using uh, to go at this. So Tableau Desktop, Tableau Web Server. I can go more into that later. There's another interesting tool in this called Student Group Builder. It'll let us pull together uh, groups of students to find, find me all left-handed Hungarian ping pong players who like swimming and then find me all right-handed Hungarian ping pong players who find swimming, uh, provided you have data for that, right? So it's only limited by what you have data on. Uh, the group builder tool is what we call relationally complete, meaning you can do a full set of relational operators, uh, intersect, sec, join, difference, et cetera, and Boolean complete, which means mostly kind of any predicate logic could be expressed in it. And if you have all variables on the student, you quickly see what that means. I can categorize students however anybody wishes to, without code, through visual interfaces. And that was the idea, uh, to do that. And then along the way, other things we're going to be adding, real-time engagement engine. We've done some scoring and predictive modeling, but we want to build this uh, kind of classification, machine learning, real-time engine that we have in SAS right, or SPSS right now. We're going to load that up, run server-side in the environment. Other things in there, let you read that later. Um, critical to this system, we'll get into this on the adoption profile here for, for how do you adopt this in an institution. 
All of these curated views store data at the lowest level of detail, which is essentially student ID, roughly, roughly depending on the domain, but student, we'll think of it as student ID or student ID, course ID, and grade. So that lowest level of detail, no aggregates, no aggregates are needed, uh, but they're anonymized. Now, if you have an anonymized data set where you can't see their last name, first name, address, zip, or email, or anything like that, but you just have all this other data, is it useful to look at an individual row? No, it's not very useful. Now, it is useful to aggregate by that individual row on the fly through many techniques, which is why we did the lowest level of detail with the anonymized view. It also means that uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm clearing a lot of HERPA hurdles right there. Now we're granting the access only to people who, according to FERPA, have a legitimate educational interest in the data. And I'm only granting them an anonymized view. If you know FERPA, you can give the that person the full student record, which is a lot more than just what's in these views. So this helps me talk to the FERPA police on, actually you have no domain here. Because technically, I can put this data on the public internet uh, as is, even solving for the re-identification problem, if those who know what that is. Uh, if you read FERPA, it's not quite the tightest language on the re-identification uh, language. Uh, so I could put it out on the internet. We don't. Um, but I have, you see, you see the argument here, lots of FERPA arguments and why you can't do this. Uh, no, there aren't FERPA arguments. There are other arguments, but not FERPA. We're coming out right now with the following views. There's a demographic view without the identifiable information for things that are useful to know, like what high school they came from, uh, the background, high school scores, testing scores, AT scores, other entrance scores that you may have on them. Uh, we can carry financial aid. I tend not to put financial aid in these anonymized views. That's a little bit dicier. Uh, we don't like to do that. Uh, now, behind the scenes, we have the same version of that view with the personal identifiable data, with the financial data, for those who need access, but only those who need access. We have an enrollment view, which is a workhorse, classes, departments, grades, colleges. This majors, minors view is kind of interesting. We've got a couple, there's two of them there, and they're usually, they're used to understand switching behavior for students, the time they do it, how frequently they do that, what that means. A lot of times we want to analyze how student switching is either helping or hurting uh, along the way. The retention one is to help with the production of retention statistics, which are also time to degree statistics. Now, how many of you have heard, you know, IR say, well, we got to do retention, that's hard. Well, actually, you know how you do retention? Okay. If I admit 3,000 students, I have a list. My, my denominator is 3,000. Very good. How many students are enrolled by the census date? At least in one class, in the fall term and fall term only. Oh, 3,000. Great. That's retention statistic, according to iPad's definition. Now, there's a couple little minor rules around there, but they're not that complicated. So it's literally the summing or the averaging of a zero or one called, is the student here this term? That's it. And so we render the, the retention table as student ID, term, zero, one, here or not. And then there's permutations on that to make it more accessible to an analyst, essentially flatten it out uh, for the retention view. Which now, when you couple that with the student group builder, you can instantly compare and contrast progression retention rates for any subpopulation of your heart's desire within minutes. And you'll see examples of that coming up. It becomes trivial. Okay. So our design principles behind this system was no aggregates. We wanted data at the lowest level of granularity. The system takes care of that for you. There's nothing to worry about or even do. Uh, by the way, the data, there's, no, there's not really a thing as indexes. There are indexes, but there's not much work to do on them in, as you have in other database environments. We also wanted no joins. We wanted the analyst to absolutely do nothing in terms of trying to link data up. You just merely pick the view, off they go. And that was feedback we got early in the process when I was at Kentucky where the analyst said, please join the data for me. I don't want to join this anymore. Uh, and it's a free operation in a hot environment. It doesn't really slow anything down. We wanted something insanely fast to have a pleasing experience with the analyst. The first time we showed this to some analysts, they started to giggle. 
<laughs> it was kind of wonderful to watch. Uh, we wanted easy to use views uh, so that uh, they can easily manipulate the data. We wanted to uh, let them bring their own tools. We also wanted to bring in all data around the learner and build a rich set of interactions. You'll see some examples of that. Uh, we have hardware in here designed that we can get designed to conserve costs. Uh, since it is an in-memory component, you can have enough uh, stuff that will exhaust in memory and the system will automatically tear down to very low cost data stores, including Hadoop, among other things. And then I already mentioned, forget your past around what you did in the database environment. So now this leads to, okay, we have all this fast technology, what are the use cases we want to point it at? Well, here's one. If a student takes class A but not class B, will they be able to pass class C, the dependency problem? How many of you are familiar with degrees? You, know, you all got degrees, right? You read the catalog, have you ever sat down and read the catalog on degrees? Like, you want to call a lawyer or something, right? In fact, I've, I've gone to my university, I've said, you know what we should do? We should take our rules for degrees in the catalog as described, put them on the table to a new student, and tell the student, if you can figure out the degree that you like that you can get out in the least amount of time, just by reading that, we'll grant you the degree. Because you'll have mastered probably every skill you need in the workforce, including negotiation skills. Uh, so our, our, our prerequisites are typically not empirically supported. There's the assumption that if you get a good grade in course A, you're going to need that for course B or course C, but that's not always the case. And so that's one use question. Um, how does SAT and high school GPA uh, influence college success in school? And uh, study after study we did at Kentucky, we'll probably find the same here at UCSD, says the ACT, SAT score is kind of low power as a predictor. The high school GPA is a big power as a predictor. A lot of discussion around high school effect, meaning are some high schools worse than others. In Kentucky, where you think we would see that, where we had a profound unevenness in schools, we didn't see a high school effect, except for like one or two. It was a minor effect, uh, meaning that high school actually helped or hurt that student independent of their GPA. But they're not saying there isn't. Mileage varies. You've got to go from state to state and look and see if there is a real high school effect. Uh, which classes have the most retakes? What's the impact of those retakes on student progression? For whom and when? We see opposite trends. We saw in one case retakes of an upper level accounting class was indicative of success, but retakes of an entry level math class was not. Which led me to the conclusion for students you can categorize taking a step backwards as either a strategic retreat that shows high self-efficacy and planning, or it's being overwhelmed. And one must know the difference between the two. Uh, <coughs> are there indications that the student's about to leave? We saw exits both high and low uh, at my last place. We'll see it here, too. Some students high leave after a year going, hmm, I think I'm going to go to Harvard after all, or wherever, uh, after they arrive. Uh, we started at Kentucky, and we're going to do the same thing here, a lot of interaction with all this analysis in mobile for the purposes of mobile nudging. So how do you poke and remind a student in the mobile app? Uh, most institutions have this email fetish about we've got to notify the student in email, for which they go, you've got to be kidding me. Aren't you a parent with your own kid? Really? You know, have you read your email? Why? It's important. Okay. Right? You text their phone. They're like, why are you texting me? You know, go away, I'm busy with my friends. That phone is with them. So we had a mobile first strategy at uh, Kentucky. We have one here at UCSD as well. And we want to do things like micro surveys and polling. One, one survey questions to students on a microphone. I think an interesting area of research would be, is a research instrument delivered on paper and or over the web that's 12, 14, 20 questions? Can that instrument be replicated in one or not one, but a series of micro surveys over time? That's a very good question. But the micro surveys are good for very simple topical kind of mindset uh, sort of things, or even practical ones. One we did at Kentucky, which was really interesting, is have you bought your books yet? Right? If you haven't bought your books yet in the second day of class, well, okay, there's probably a little bit of planning problem with that student. Each one of those micro-surveys is designed to have an intervention right after it. 
you know, oh, well, you can do X, Y, Z, click here for more information. So the microsurvey really is more of an interaction technique than it is a survey. Uh, certainly class performance. Uh, we'll be working with our teaching and learning commons folks on some cl in class and tutoring type uh, scenarios around uh, messaging students in the middle of. Uh, in Kentucky, it was with our chemistry department on how to notify students in a personalized way based on certain events in their class, especially fa failure to do well in an early assessment. Uh, and, and so that, I think those are very useful things. Uh, I, what I always wanted to do, because of my daughter, is, um, is, a, is a call to wake them up. To which my daughter said, you're going to have to send, set eight calls to me. Because she's constantly turning off her alarms and falling back asleep. Um, and most of the adults in the room would like, oh, you've got to be kidding me, Vince. Except for the folks in the athletics department. They're like, oh no, we need that. We tell our students you need your sleep, but they're not waking up. We've got to get them out to class. Uh, Final course grade availability sounds kind of crazy, but um, a simple thing we did at Kentucky was as soon as the faculty member posted the final grade, the student got a push notification on their phone, your grade's been posted. Now, we didn't do it because we wanted to be nice to the student. We did it because they were constantly hitting our servers and hitting refresh, and we were getting a denial of service attack. Literally, a denial of service attack around grading time. We're like, oh my god, already. <laughs> now, the problem was the system was so fast, like the faculty would like type the grade and hit enter, and then probably be doing a little more paperwork, putting the other grade in. And literally, a student would get the notification, get their grade in, and send the nasty e email off to the faculty member. So we got angry complaints from the faculty member. Well, how did my student get? So it took us a little bit of time to get the faculty used to that speed. Uh, but students appreciated that. We have a mobile app that's going to continue to undergo evolution to accommodate what I call these analytics in action. We talk about actionable analytics, meaning analytics for decision makers. I like put it into action. Nudge people, get people to do things uh, right then and there. Now, some eye candy here. Uh, this is a simple one that we're, that we're doing here at UCSD. It's just a simple you know, chart of students enrolled uh, by different graduate school, pharmacy school, medicine, undergraduate, different numbers and charts over time, PGIS. That's not the point. Let me get the point here a little bit. You can, get, you can create hundreds of those. When I left Kentucky, we had 1,000 workbooks, 4,000 tabs created by the community. Less than 5 2% were created by a central group. So it becomes ridiculously easy to visualize anything you want in this type of environment. And the community did that. Here's one that was quite as interesting at Kentucky. Our first, and it's turning out to be the same place at UCSD, our peer tutoring center in our TLC is wanting to do the exact same thing here. Uh, in Kentucky, that group, through a tracking app we had built for them, was tracking students' <laughs> visits peer tutoring center. <coughs> and this bar is zero visits. This bar is one to three visits, and this is four to 90. And yes, there are some students who go a lot. I guess they're lonely. And this is year 2011, 12, 13, 14. Uh, now these bars here, yellow, blue, and purple, or orange, blue, and purple, represent a readiness group. And the readiness grouping is based upon the student's high school GPA, their SAT or ACT score, and a couple other predictors like ethnic, uh, ethnicity and on or off campus that are highly predictive of, of progression. And you're put into three bands, low, middle, or high. So if you look at it, if I'm one of those high-end students, if I don't go to the tutoring center, 90% of the time I'll come back into my next term. But if I go to the tutoring center a lot, that raises to 97%. That's a pretty good list. If I'm in the lowest group, it's 79%, and that raises up here to 91%. So there's benefits gained by all levels of the distribution, right? Which also led to the conclusion, my gosh, we got to tell our advanced students, get to peer tutoring. Advanced students feel like it's beneath them. I don't go to see a peer tutor. And they had to change their marketing to get them in. Now, this study caused this group to receive another couple million dollars to set up a new center at the other end of campus. When word got out about that, every other center on campus wanted the tracking system and the analytics to replicate 
uh, the same finding. And we had several of those, some of them not always positive. This is what I did when I was just playing with the system on a Sunday morning in my row with a cup of coffee uh, at home, not work. And um, I was just looking at the use of online. And I started to look at online, how, how, what's the consumption pattern of online classes for our students? And I started to compare athletes to non-athletes, URM students to non-URM students, Pell Grant students to non-Pell Grant students, students who are in a readiness problem bucket, like they're coming in with deficiencies of some kind that need addressing, and those who are not. And I saw a very consistent shape over and over and over. So I said, oh my gosh, let's lump all of those groups together and remove them from the general population. And that's these two lines. So this orange line are all of the students that are either at risk or time starved. Think of athletes as time starved, not necessarily at risk. But minority students and others, perhaps at risk, I mean time starved, but also at risk. And then this blue line is everybody in the student population minus those. And now you see two wildly different consumption patterns. And this is spread across that spectrum of readiness from very low readiness to very high readiness. At the highest level of readiness, the two groups are practically the same. But at the lowest level of readiness, they diverge wildly. The lower readiness or the, uh, for, for the time starved and everybody else were higher consumers of online learning. So I saw a wildly different consumption pattern. So I said, okay, great. What's the impact on time to degree? Well, this is a six-year, five-year, and four-year graduation rate. Again, um, this is the readiness group, so readiness folks here, high readiness folks here. And this is the consumption of online. And generally speaking, the people at the lower end of the readiness spectrum, if they consume, they consume more, more classes and they were aided uh, in their time to degree, which is fascinating. So it looked like online was having a positive effect on time to degree. Here's one we did for at UK, and we'll probably do it again here, too, and at, at UCSD, because of all the building we're doing, for uh, one of the business schools in Kentucky was undergoing renovation, and they wanted to know how to readjust their classrooms uh, for the renovation, because some rooms are going to be out of commission. And this is every hour of the day, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I believe, yes. And these are a section of the classes in the room. A big blue square is 100% utilized, and that utilization is how many seats are in the room versus how many students are enrolled to be in that seat. Not actually in it, but enrolled. And if it's blue, it's undergraduate. If it's bright red, it's graduate or professional. And then if it's this little tiny dot, it's zero. And our dean looked at it and he goes, he just circled a couple points and said, okay, I know what to do. Thank you. Go away. There wasn't a single number on this chart, yet he had a plan for action. Right, so that was the power of visualization. Now, to set this up, we had to take the course schedule, which kind of fits on a spreadsheet, a big one, of every class and the meeting schedule. And we turned it into a data structure that was every building, every room, every day of the year, every five minute block, two numbers, size of the room, enrolled capacity. Now that becomes, initially it was a quarter million rows, grew to about a billion rows with a, like an eight or nine year window of data. That's a lot of data, but not to Hana. Hana doesn't care how big it is. So you can analyze that big mass of half a billion rows pretty quickly, pretty forthwith, no, no issues. The reason we did that, it gave us tremendous ability to select, filter, slice, and dice. So we exploded the data to enable easy visualization. That's not the data warehousing credo, is it? No, the data warehousing credo is I've got to conserve the data and somebody else will explode it for visualization later. We're like, no, we're going to do that. Easy to do in this environment. It's actually not that big of a data set because uh, of the compression that goes on. Classic one on enrollment by section size. Lots of things you can do with this. The moral of the story is not that these visuals are possible. But this particular sequence, I spent two to three hours on a Sunday morning going through about 10 versions 
of this with iterative ones. The final one took me maybe 40 minutes, half hour. And I probably spent easily half my time futzing over color. No, that color's not good enough. Oh, line's too thin. Make it thicker. Well, no, no, I'm changing here. Right? Interior decorating stuff. Kind of wild, right? And as I was doing this, I'm going, you know, while I'm analyzing, let's say, 20,000 students, it could be 200,000 students. It doesn't make any difference. It could be 2 million. Size doesn't matter in this environment. So, that leads to cultural preconditions now. Meaning, if you're going to unleash this sort of power of data on the hands of everybody, what do you need? in terms of your culture. And so I, I'm going to start with a statement that probably is so representative of our times, I will let you read it. Have you ever witnessed that? They keep wanting to remind you the data is wrong. No, 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 you're not looking at it right. No, 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 right? Or they're preventing the conversation from coming up so that it can be validated. And I agree, this is the number one human dysfunction that I have fought in my 15 years as a higher ed CIO, and to some extent even in industry too. Uh, many human beings are profoundly defensive about the data that they operate under. They treat it as part of their body, and if it's challenged, they, you get a bodily reaction uh, as if they were challenged. So they can't disassociate themselves from the data. So what we have to do is we have to democratize this analysis. And I don't like to use the word democratize because I think it's a very overloaded term that often is used with rose-colored glasses on. But in this case, I'm going to. When average people who have a sharp mind but perhaps a weaker political voice have data, they can now speak. And they do. And what I've witnessed in the past is data hoarders who like to come in and say, well, we have the data, and three people open up their laptop, click, 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 and go, eh, that's not correct. And as an example, I was at a president retreat at UK, and the dean of, of our business school, who I know well, and he wanted that business building study, he was waxing on about his great advising program and the big impact it had on student success. Sight unseen, just me opening up my laptop, playing with Tableau, and creating a couple groups and group builder and all that. While he's giving his 10-minute presentation, I developed the analytics. And I validated everything he said. I'm like, yes, in 2011, you had a divergence, and then we're seeing improvement. And I turned it around to him and showed him, he goes, oh, wow, I actually have data to support that. <laughs> That's the story of our times. So when we democratize the data, I think lots of people can now can, can evaluate claims and come to their understanding. So data hoarders, uh, we saw a couple people leave who are data hoarders say, well, I can't play this game anymore here. I'm going to go play it somewhere else. And they go up and leave the institution. Um, what happened in Kentucky, my IR group, we actually shrunk it dramatically uh, down to about three to four people. And we didn't create reports. We didn't even create dashboards. We didn't even do reporting. We did research research. And of course, attestation, meaning the numbers are accurate. That's all we did. The community did the reporting. IT did the reporting that was needed from an external standpoint. Um, this creates a sea change. I've heard all the objections to this data dysfunction. Oh, but Vince, you don't know how many ways we describe a student. We've got, so we got so many definitions of a student. I'm like, really? I got one, the student said sitting in a classroom. What's another one? Okay, they're not sitting in a classroom, but they're enrolled. Well, they're in another classroom. Okay, what's, I mean, I pulled out the pencil. I said, oh, let's write down all the definitions. And usually around four or five, the group that's complaining kind of stops. They run out of definitions. The problem is we haven't pushed the conversation well enough with them to challenge these claims. Now, I had responsibility for IR and institutional effectiveness, so I had full responsibility for reporting all this data externally and opining about different ways of doing it, so I'm deeply familiar with all the issues in this. Uh, so I'm always surprised. <laughs> oh, but you don't have, know how many ways we define a student. In fact, I had one person, we got so many definitions of GPA. I said, oh, really? Describe them. I think one. You know. We actually had five at Kentucky, and for five very good reasons. Okay, how many do you have? It's just a smokescreen around other issues. And the other issues are, well, I really can't trust the folks in 
fine arts with the data. You know, they're just bad actors and they don't really know how to read the data. So it's a trust issue. So you get a lot of that. Um, this one is kind of interesting and there's a germ of truth to it. There are some people on the learning side who um, feel very strongly that learning is kind of an intractable exercise that can't really be analyzed, almost like a sacred uh, experience. And those of us on the science side were like, no, of course, we can break this down and just like elaborate, decompose it, and figure out how to improve it. But there is somewhat of an argument to be had on uh, don't be so convinced that you can deconstruct learning. Uh, so when I enter this debate with faculty who say, well, you really can't look at this data. It's not helpful. It's not going to help you. I say, I understand that there's two camps of thought on here. One is that learning cannot be understood. Others who say it can. That's okay. I'm not here to resolve that debate. I'm just here to prevent you who say it cannot be decomposed from preventing those who want to decompose it. That's not fair. That's not playing nice. Uh, <coughs> but the most honest one I get is, oh, but the politics here make it impossible. And that's usually the, the thing that I hear uh, on this. So we pushed, uh, we published here at, at SD here, and we had a Kentucky, an analytics community of practice principles, not quite a data privacy thingy. That's not what it's about. It's about if you want to analyze data in a community setting, here are the clubhouse rules. Be safe and secure, of course. The second one, be collegial. It's basically saying, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's students. And I had a gentleman in arts and sciences in Kentucky, Jesse Hedge, love him dearly, great guy and everything. But he was creating a micro survey he was going to send to engineering students in a personalized way that said, are you happy with your major? Come to an arts and sciences major fair. The engineering faculty heard about it. Oh my god, there were pitchforks and torches and, you know. And I called Jesse. Oh, I'm just trying to help this. I said, Jesse, that's, well, how do you think engineering? They should understand trying to help. Jesse? Let's take this back to governance. I said, okay, okay. Governance got on it, and they're like, hey, actually, this is a good idea. Let's send a personalized message to all students in certain categories and say, come to the major fair. And so we had a good response that made everybody happy by, by enforcing. But I was ready to pull his access. I said, Jesse, i got to pull your access to the system. Because you can't do this to the community. you got a responsibility to the community. Got to help improve data quality. Like a lot of people say, Oh, but Vince, the data in your system stinks. I said, my system? I don't enter that data. Oh, your staff does. You mean your data? Oh, okay. How do we enter it? Here's how you enter it. At Kentucky, Null Instructor was the most popular instructor we had on campus. Taught an insane amount of students, right? But when the university started to discuss budget reallocation formulas and said, you have to identify your primary instructor before we're going to allocate your budget, null instructor disappeared in a year. Just like that. Data quality improved dramatically. So you got to set the rules of the game up to help improve data quality, but you got to get the community to point it out. A lot of groups are afraid, oh my God, they're going to see my bad data that's been going on for 10 years and we've been having to keep the errors there so we don't get people excited. Right? So the dirty laundry has to get. I said, don't worry, that was prior management. It's a new day. Fess up. Let's get on with it. Uh, some people say, oh, but here's how we classify students. Vince. You can't possibly classify them that way. Well, can't we classify them together at the same time? Well, is that technically possible? Well, I can classify it in a number of ways at the same time easily. Oh. In fact, once I classify it 10 different ways, I can tell you the exact difference between two classification schemes. Oh. So this either-or thinking has to disappear and say, hey, we can be open-minded. We can allow multiple frames to look at the data simultaneously. This is one when we look at students. Understand students are different and progress at different rates. Don't, don't jump to conclusions about what to do with them. And then most importantly, you have to share. Information isn't power. Information sharing is power. That's the new regime. That's not how humans are wired, and don't feel bad. Many animals are also not wired that way. Animals thrive off of information hiding and information obfuscation, built into the DNA, camouflage, among other behaviors. So it's also built into the human DNA. We have to transform that into helping my neighbor get smarter is power. That's a big statement in administration lane. Helping my neighbor get smarter is power. How many practice that? 
I'm, just, I'm here to tell everybody, if you don't practice it, it's futile to build these systems because you'll have one very top executive who wants that heroic narrative to come true, and by golly, it will come true, damn the data, and the data will suddenly look like it came true. That's because everybody will fudge around and make the data come true, and people will quietly do their shadow systems to learn truth on their own terms. Right? We got to get at that executive information dysfunction. We need some attributes for success. Faculty champions, to me, are so critical. When a small number of faculty who are really enthused and excited about how this can improve what they do, my life is now a lot easier. Uh, because universities do work hard, they really do, to try to help their faculty. Uh, sometimes they gotta scream a bunch, but universities end up responding. Um, academic units who, who have the need and the skill to analyze data, absolutely. We've got a full-time community manager on it now, and we're gonna support a regular session, actually twice a month, uh, to bring the community in to share and learn about the data, different techniques, what you've been doing, be revealing all your analytical plans with each other. I hear they're analyzing to steal from us over there. No, you gotta come to the community and say what you're analyzing. Okay? You gotta be open with your plans. Obviously, technology, integration, standards, analytical platform, good roadmap. I think this does require top-down executive support or a mandate. Not nearly a mandate, but an executive who will stand by you as you do this work. So. Now I'm going to jump into future considerations. Uh, sticking with my movie theme here, uh, Alien, the movie. This was a poster they had early on in cyberspace. Nobody can hear you scream. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's just a way of saying just because we go digital with our student doesn't mean we go dark. Okay, so I am watching... That gentleman in the back row text away, not watching me. And now he's looking up and engaging me. So as a faculty member, we do this all the time in our face-to-face -face classes. We are constantly personalizing based on data that our cortex is sensing in the environment. Just because we go digital doesn't mean we don't do that anymore. And more importantly, we have to know when we go digital what works and what doesn't work. So I can't let a vendor go dark on me and say, well, that's our secret sauce. Our shareholders need to make a million on this. I'm sorry, this is a public good. I need to know what works in teaching. Thank you very much. Go your separate way. By the way, if you get through this maze of 10 to the 629 first, have, go at it. But you're not gonna. You're gonna need us anyway. Uh, I think this is very important. We get a lot of debate on, oh my God, we can't collect this data. Oh my God, we can't look at this data. I'm like, you're in the classroom. You're collecting data in your head and you're looking at it all the time anyway. Right? Oh, I can't be biased as a faculty. Then have students come completely covered. Right? We hold new technology to much higher standard than any of the old. We will debate forever when we go online what the quality will be, and we will overlook all sorts of quality errors in our current environment. All the time. It happens all the time. When the internet came out, it was held to a higher standard initially before adoption was, was guaranteed. Wrong way to look at it. I think we can do things now with the technology to work within the confines of working memory limits, meaning within a four or five second time window as students interact with their content and their courses in an online environment to be able to detect what's going on in that stream and to take intervention. Uh, and here's a use case I like to push, and I'm still waiting for one to come out. Uh, for those of us who have lecture capture in our classrooms, imagine the lecture capture in the whole class being up available on the web, and the student who attended your class is now at 11 o'clock at night listening to your lecture on dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And let's pretend they're listening to your, your speaking writing on the board or whatever, and they replay that five times in a row. Well, there's two hypotheses here. One is they're really confused, or two, they really like the way dorsolateral prefrontal cortex sounds. Okay? My money's on the first. Right? Well, if that's the case, then the system can know that, and the system can alert a peer tutor and say, call this student. And that peer tutor can call the student and say, hey, Mary, you having trouble in Vince's class on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? Now, outside the student freaking out going, who's watching me? That's kind of interesting. Just-in-time delivery of additional context right in the middle of scaffolding, the, the, getting the information in the brain. 
This is not hard, technically. It's kind of trivial, actually. It's much more harder operationally and organizationally to try to pull off. But this is where we're going. And now with machine learning, this round trip won't exist. The machine learning algorithm will sit here and on the phone. We will develop machine learning algorithms within that central system, push it down into the device, and it will detect the confusion and broker the conversation in almost a true peer-to-peer -peer fashion. <coughs> Which leads to, I think this whole artificial intelligence machine learning thing is make, just make no mistake about it. I've been watching technology trends my whole career, and I do kind of one thing. I look at all the major companies and where they're putting their R&D dollars. Google, Microsoft, all of them. AI machine learning. End of story, full stop. Done. It's over. It's over. It's happening. Get over it. Okay? We can debate whether we should or not. It's over. It's going to happen. If we don't do it, somebody else will. Okay? So it's going to happen. The machine learning craze is very real. Uh, the deep learning network and the AI craze is extremely real. And it will hit this neck of the woods, and it will hit quick. And my advice is the academy, let's get ahead of this. Uh, now there's some advantages here. We can take advantage of it. Uh, I went to IBM when they announced their Watson for education. And they're thinking, oh my god, we can answer questions. I'm like, well, that's kind of nice. But in education, a teacher isn't just to like give dispense answers, like a little Pez machine. Right? We often throw a question back at the student to get them to kind of construct their knowledge a little better. So could Watson, instead of giving me an answer, give me a question to help me restructure my knowledge? To which the designers of Watson were like, uh, well, no, we haven't, no, that's not the case we put it. That's a much harder problem. I think we'll get there. I think it'll be kind of interesting to build a little artificial intelligent Plato equivalent, or Socrates equivalent. Um, now we got this vastness of space to analyze, and I think machine learning techniques are going to be useful even in atheoretical approaches. Uh, when you involve this time series element that learning occurs over time, you suddenly have all these variables. Think of all these hundreds of variables. But now they're constantly shifting. You've got to shift them backwards and forwards in time across every sort of grouping of time you can think of. That's a big data problem. That's going to require machine learning techniques to address. So if we get this intelligent tutor at a low cost out there where a lot of the interaction with the content and the enrichment of knowledge is aided, not done entirely, but aided by the computer, what is the role of the faculty member? Now I was having this conversation a few years back with a computer science engineering faculty member who had, and I knew him well, Jim Griffin, he had this look of horror on his face. He goes, I, I don't like that. What would I do? I said, Jim, you stop giving boring lectures. He's like, well, I, uh, and he's a computer science expert. And he was like, <gasps> you know, gasping for breath at the proposition that he wouldn't be needed. Far from it. We're going to need them like crazy. So I think we have to think what's the effect on the faculty life here. And since I'm a lazy faculty, I don't want to do that boring stuff. I want to have like meaningful conversations with my students. And if I can get the computer to do everything else, I got lots of other things I could do with them, right? And so we can get back to our roots. In fact, the large lecture was invented kind of 21st century, 20th century style to do like mass manufacturing. It's crazy. So we go back to the personal interaction that's needed uh, uh, from a learning standpoint. And uh, so I think, you know, we can try to motivate and inspire students. That's like a really hard puzzle. I'll give you an example. My, uh, my nephew, who's married now and doing well, but at the time he was, when I was at DePaul University, he was going to college, and my sister called me and said, my son is having a miserable time in college. He's not doing well. He's going to live with you this summer, and you're going to whip him into shape. Faculty member that I am and, and administrator that I am. So I said, okay, sent him down, took him in, had him work for me. Great worker, great kid. And man, I'm like, you know, pounding. I'm, I'm trying to tell him what, you know, Next year, my sister calls me, you did such a lousy job, you're taking him this summer, too. <laughs> uh, now, none of this worked, but he met a girl. And she said, dude, we ain't getting married to at least get an associate's degree. He got an associate's degree. So, my point is, I worked hard to inspire him. It was hard, 
my sister and her, and her husband did. It was hard. It was his future wife that was the inspiration. That's the hard part, is how do you get motivation hooked up into the learning and do that with the students. And so I think all of this technology can help return us to our roots, which we have forgotten in the last hundred years. So that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi, I'm Brad. Um, so my question has to do with uh, the purported skills gap in the United States that you hear a lot of talk about. Um, and it's, it's the, um, this disconnect between what employers are willing to spend on learning and development, you know, because they don't know how long you know, people are being retained for shorter and shorter periods of time, and also skills are becoming <coughs> more and more obsolete yep. faster. Um, so there's the gap between that and, and also versus what you get at, at, a, at an institute of higher learning in terms of a degree uh, and how that degree is described and the skills, <coughs> kind of the skills fingerprint that yep. is associated with that degree. What can universities do to better match up that skills fingerprint and track yep. the data around individual yep. skills that, that students are learning yep. such that they are better fits for you know, their jobs? So that's a really good question. I've, I've been in many groups over years on exactly that conversation, both in industry and us trying to broker that dialogue. And I always sit back in the room and go, wait a minute, okay. I was reading a while ago, like 30% of the jobs that exist today didn't exist five years ago. That means like 90% in 10 years, there'll be a brand new set of jobs with new skills. What are we designing to? Skills next year or skills 10 years from now? Okay. Now, if you look at the technological society we're living in, where nano basically rules and information complexity, meaning text and, and all that stuff, rules. Then you go, okay, what are the skills that underlie that? Well, it's going to look like classic liberal arts skills, both on the science and the humanities side. Because we're going to need a workforce that can adapt and pick up new skills based on foundational skills. And so at the undergraduate level, I really think what's needed is to produce more graduates who've got higher liberal arts and or liberal science type skills, and then get them ready to absorb topical applied skills at different points in their career and be ready to hop. Example, I pushed my daughter super hard on math. I said, girls, don't do math. I said, you're bright, honey. She got a five on her AP Calc, but she still holds a grudge against me and won't do anything with math. But when she enters the workforce, there might be an opportunity where she goes, okay, I think I'll dust off those math skills. That's what we want. That's what I want, I think. So I think you gotta break the market down in terms of what skills, what time frame. And the technology will tend to shine better on the topical skills that are applied within a shorter time horizon. Because they're kind of going to be more uh, built off of other skills we've developed. But I, I've been telling folks, I, you know, if I'm graduating today, I probably want to know calc well, I probably want to know molecules well, I probably want to know DNA well. Uh, I definitely want to know something about machine learning and AI. And I better leave with skills in all of those. Because even if I'm marketing, Chances are I'm going to be working on a firm that's dealing with one of those, and if I don't understand it, I'm not, much, not much I can do in marketing. Right? So the world is getting very technical in many dimensions simultaneously and computations underlying it. And so I actually think hopefully we'll get back to kind of this, this liberal arts core again and then quickly scaffold uh, uh, the, the professional training that goes on top of that quickly. Cool. Thank you. It better be a whopper. <laughs> oh, great, the pressure. Um, it, thank you. Enjoyed hearing about your system, and I was curious. AI tends to be a winner-take-all uh, kind of system in the market just because when you aggregate the data, you get per better predictive abilities. Um, I didn't see enough to know if that's true here, and so I'm curious. Is yeah, it true? And that's then if so is there like a plan for rollout? You see why? What's the market going to look like for this invention yeah, in a few years? That's a really good question. And the further out you go from the classroom to what I call classic progression predictions, 
big data doesn't matter as much. But the more you get into the classroom, especially when you start to uncover psychological profiles that might replicate in the large, big data becomes of interest. And so I think it's kind of a bifurcated approach where institutions might not have to get big data for a lot of their population stuff that they do, uh, like uh, retention and predictions of retention in the aggregate. But when you get to the learning analytics and the nudging side, um, sharing of data may become useful. Now, understand that there's a difference between building the model and deploying the model. So the model can be built off of all sorts of training sets and deployed locally with or without sharing of massive amounts of data. Uh, it's just, can you get enough data to build the model? I think this is to be discovered and to be written right now over the next several years in the learning analytics sphere. And I think that's where the big data is going to come from on the learning analytics side. Uh, because when you do the time series analysis and get all this very integrated clickstream that's pretty curated and the standards around that for doing that, when that kicks in, big data sets will become very interesting. It'll be almost like a human genome puzzle. So I, I think that's where it will occur in the learning analytics space. I think in the classic retention progression sort of stuff, no, you don't need big data for that. Yeah. Thank you.